Welcome to the Friendship Sermon Podcast. Friendship exists to bring people to Jesus and to develop them into fully mature reproducing followers. Gather to worship with us Sundays at 9 or 1045 or visit us online at fcbc.church. See, y'all are already doing it. You don't need me. I love it. I love it. I love it. Like, it just absolutely blows me away. We weren't able to include all the videos. It would have gone on for probably another 30 minutes. You probably would have preferred that rather than listening to me. But um, it's important that you understand that God has called us to work. That's what we've been talking about these last three weeks. Uh, Two weeks ago, we talked about the creation of work and how God has created all of us to work. Last week, we talked about the fall of work and why work is hard and why work is difficult. And this week, we're talking about work redeemed and how we integrate our faith into our work. And you guys are already doing it. As we just saw from those video clips, this is how you are serving God in your workplace. And so I want to take just a couple of minutes this morning. We have jam-packed this service, and I just want to walk you through how to integrate your faith into your workplace, how to redeem your work. And for so many of you, is like, well, Robert, I can't necessarily just share the gospel in my workplace because it's illegal. And even in our country, you're right, you're paid to work, and you're not necessarily paid to hold a Bible study. And so you can't just openly share your faith in many of your workplaces. Many of you can, but many of you can't. And you're like, well, Robert, we exist to bring people to Jesus, to develop them into fully mature reproducing followers. I struggle to do that. And so I want to share a different approach to work that many of you are already doing. And what I want to encourage you to do with your work is to seek work that allows you to spread shalom. Okay? Seek work that allows you to spread shalom. And if you're like, what is shalom? This this will let me know how long you've been in church, all right? It's a Hebrew word that gets thrown around a lot in churches. And this Hebrew word shalom is actually a very complicated word. It's usually translated peace in the Bible, but the English word for peace is like this big, and the Hebrew word for shalom is like this big. Um, At its heart, it means completeness. Okay, the the ironic blessing, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. It's the idea of completeness. My dad used to say that biblical peace, this idea of shalom, is when your life is in one piece, P-I-E-C-E. When your life is fragmented, which I think many of us feel like we are going a hundred different directions, and this is broken, and this is over here, and this, you do not have P-E-A-C-E, which is shalom, which is that completeness. It also has the idea of safety and soundness in your body. Um, it has the idea of welfare, health, and prosperity. A Hebrew greeting is shalom, shalom. It means prosperity prosperity to you, wealth and, and, and health and health and welfare. It also has the idea of peace and, and quiet, tranquility, contentment. The Adirondack chair on the still mountain lake. Okay, that is shalom. All right, but it encompasses all of these things. It also has a communal element, meaning friendship, meaning it basically means that all is right in the world. If you have shalom, then all is right in the world. And really what I'm challenging you to do, and I believe that most of you are already doing this, is seek work whereby you can bring some of these things into the world. All right? Hugh Wood, who opened up the interview there, he puts in septic systems. All right? How is that shalom? How many people in our world die from contaminated drinking water? Okay? Most of us don't even realize that when we flush the toilet, it goes into a septic tank that Hugh or somebody else installed and goes out into the ground, and our well is, what, 150 feet away? And because of that, we don't even think about it, but it brings health, welfare, shalom to us. Until Friday night when my septic backed up and I had to get a snake out, and oh man, I was so mad, but I was grateful for all the other thousand days that it works so well, okay? So many of you, if you're a teacher and you're teaching education and you're teaching kids how to read, how to write, when you organize things, if you're a project manager, you bring completeness and some of you are safety officers and you ensure that people don't get hurt on the job. Others of you manage the finances and make sure that the company will still have money to operate in the future. All of these ideas bring about shalom, and this is really, honestly, what we as Christians are called to be doing. Part of the original work in the garden was to make the garden produce and to protect it. It was to bring about a completeness, a safety, a soundness, a prosperity, a tranquility within the garden. We exist to bring shalom in the world. When we act rightly, 
when we do what is right, when we live as Christians, several people on the video said, I just try to be honest in my work. I try to be Christ-like. The effect of righteousness will be peace, okay? Will be shalom. When we do what is right in our jobs, we bring about shalom, and the result of that righteousness is quietness and trust forever. Why is our country falling apart? Why is our country a disaster? Because we lack righteousness. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, not what is right in God's eyes. And when you go to work, even if you're not able to have a Bible study, and you're not able to like share the gospel, but anytime you do what is right, it brings about peace, shalomness, wholeness, completeness, at least in a small way, and that is your contribution to advancing this mission of God in the world. This is when you all stare at me, and I'm like super excited, because I'm like, this is what y'all are doing! And you're like, okay, I know you're like taking it in, right? Okay, so not only does righteousness yield shalom, but this is the gospel. Is this not the gospel of Jesus? The word that he sent to Israel preaching the good news of what? Peace. And where does that peace come from? Through Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we can put in every septic system. We can create clear water for the world. We can have the best law enforcement that gets rid of all crime in the streets. We can have the best education. We can have the best health care. We can have the best financial management. We can have all of that. And we ultimately will not have true shalom unless we have what? Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, you understand, that's the heart of the ultimate gospel. That is what brings true shalom. But it's not just about praying this prayer so you go to heaven when you die. If you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and if you are pursuing him and you have peace with God, you will then in turn work to bring that same peace throughout the world, that same shalom, that same completeness, wholeness, welfare, prosperity throughout the world, because that is what Jesus does. In fact, even the gospel armor that we put on, we are to bring Prepare our feet with what? The preparation of the gospel of peace. And again, I think many of us think that means we're gearing up every day to share our faith, which I do hope you have opportunity to do. I'm not undermining that. But predominantly, the gospel of peace is the good news that we can bring wholeness, welfare, again, through Jesus Christ, but everything that we do can ultimately spread the gospel of peace. When you do good work as a student... And you turn in your work on time, and you study, and you do to the best of your ability, you are bringing about prosperity for yourself, honestly. But ultimately, that yields a society of educated people who are able to have greater peace. My friends, I want us to work to bring shalom into the world. So in that regard, let's talk about your job. Let's begin to unpack your career. Let's unpack the work that you do. And last week, you remember we talked about one of the frustrations is that secular people have better ideas than Christian people. So I'm going to steal this idea from a guy named Mike Wynn, who I believe is a, I don't believe he's a Christian. And he's put together this idea of how to figure out your, your best calling, how to figure out the ideal thing you should do. And I had to adapt it a little because he talked about what you love. I actually think it's not about what you love. It's about or what the world needs. It's really about where shalom is needed. So that's the adjustment that I've made on here. What I want you to see is we're going to walk through this, how to decide whether your job or the career that you have is the career that you should have. I think 90% of you should probably stay in your job. But I do think that some of you, God is calling to a different career, and I want to walk you through this morning how to know where God is calling you, okay? So let's begin, and let's kind of walk this through. First question is, where is shalom needed, okay? So ask yourself, where is the world not complete? Where is there an empty lot that needs a house, that needs a building? Where is there a kitchen that's falling apart that needs to be remodeled? Where is there education that needs to be put in, put in place? Where are there hurting people that need either medical care or that need trauma care or that need counseling or that need, you name it, where is there brokenness in the world? Where is there a need for quiet, tranquility, and contentment? And begin to ask yourself, there's a pastor that described it as a holy discontent. God begins to put something within you that you're like, this is what the world needs and this is what God has called me to do, which kind of the next one, where has God called you? Some of you are like, I am not being a missionary. Okay, uncross your arms, mentally, relax. The first calling in scripture, in fact, I found this fascinating, probably 70, 80, 90% of the times in scripture that we are called, we are called to what? To belong to Jesus Christ. 
We are not called to be missionaries or pastors. Most of the time, the call in Scripture, what was Jesus' call? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Your call is not necessarily to be a missionary, to be a pastor. Your call is to follow Jesus. And so I ask you today, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Jesus is calling you. And some of you this morning, I think the vast majority of you have responded to that call. But some of you may be coming here for the first time. You might be coming here for the hundredth time or the thousandth time. The question is, when Jesus says, I am Lord, will you follow me? Have you responded to that call? Because that's the first call. Forget your vocational, your career call. Jesus is calling you to follow him. He is calling you to be a saint, not by your own works, but by his death and resurrection. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to make you whole. He wants to give you peace. Have you responded to that call? Only then can you begin to respond to the secondary call. Okay, and this is to a specific place or role, okay? So what specifically has God called you to? Again, this is where he does sometimes call people to be pastors and missionaries. He often calls people to be married. He calls people to have children. If you have children, one of the calls that you have is to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If God has called you into a different career field or a particular place, if you've signed a contract, okay, some of you, you know, you sign up in military, it's done in chunks of time. Other times, you know, you, you, if you commit to three years in the trade, they'll pay off for your school and other things you may be under a contract. If that's the deal, then you're locked in. That is what God has called you to do. Not all of you are called to paid work. Some of you are called to care for your aging parents. That may not be what you want to do. That may not be what is most financially profitable to you, but that right now is the call that you have. Nobody likes changing poopy diapers, okay? But if you have babies, if you have grandchildren, that is part of the call in your life. So to what has God called you? What place or role? Next, you want to ask, how has God gifted you? Romans chapter 12 says that we all have spiritual gifts. Not only that, But we have vocational gifts. We have knowledge gifts. We have networks. You understand you can reach people that I can't reach. You have friends and family that they won't listen to me, but they'll listen to you. You have expertise. Some of you have job authority, positional authority over a lot of people. Some of you have influential authority over a lot of people simply because of the networks that you formed over the years. You have job skills that you can do things with your hands that I could never do. Every one of us has abilities and skills and giftedness, and you need to ask yourself, God, what have you given to me? Some of you have financial resources that others don't. Some of you have equipment resources that others don't. Some of you have educational resources that others don't. You have been given all of these things by God, and you want to say, okay, God, this is the gifts that you've given me. This is the call that you've given to me, and this is where shalom is most needed in the world. Right now, my aging parents need to be cared for. It's not my greatest gift, but that is what you have called me to. That is the peace that they need. That's what I'm going to engage in. Lastly, you want to ask what you get paid for. And this is important. The worker is worthy of his wages. You don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. It is biblical to be paid for your work. But I also want to challenge you that you need to be wary of the cultural influence. You probably don't need to be paid as much as you think you need to be paid. All right? I know when I first started ministry, I made a whole lot less. I also had a lot fewer mouths to feed. My kids will say I'm constantly worried about money, constantly because the bills get higher and higher. And over the last several years, I've begun to kind of obsess, like, I need more money because I have now I'm facing college and the kids have cars and the expenses get really high. And it's like, I need more, I need more, I need more. I used to live in a townhouse. That was very cheap. I now live in a single family home on three and a half acres. That's very expensive. More stuff to break, more grass to mow, more, you know, septic tanks to unclog. You know, there's a lot more there. Well, Not necessarily anything wrong with that. God can provide. But you know, God has been speaking to me recently, my friends, that maybe I don't need more money. Maybe I need a lower level of living. Maybe I need to move back into a townhouse. You're like, you're going to put 10 people in a townhouse? In America, we don't do that. But around the world, you put 10 people in a two-bedroom flat. Okay? Again, what we think of as normal is insane. And the amount of money it costs to keep that up is insane. You may not need to make as much as you think you need to make. You've just conditioned yourself to do that. And so I want to ask you to be honest with yourself. How much do you need to get made? Now, some of you are being underpaid 
and your boss is taking advantage of you, and there is nothing wrong with asking for a raise or transferring to another organization that will pay you a fair wage and pay you what is, is worth for that part of the, of that, the job skills that you're doing. But I want to ask you, like, this really should be the last of your concern as to what you get paid for, because ultimately we trust God to provide. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't know how much a cow costs, but I would think you could sell a cow for a couple thousand bucks, and if he owns that many, you multiply it out, he's got millions of dollars. And you understand it's a metaphor and he actually has all the money in the world. The point is, if God is that rich, he can provide for us. And so I want to ask you this morning, first and foremost, don't focus on what you get paid for. Focus on where shalom is needed in the world. Balance that with where God has called you, how God has gifted you, and then weigh the the cost factor as well. If you are the primary breadwinner, God most likely does expect you to work. In our community, he most likely expects you to get paid well because you need to provide for your mortgage, your car payment, college payments, all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But I just want to make sure that you are thinking biblically and scripturally and being aware that you might be able to change your career. Are you following me? Let me give you two tension principles that are important for us to keep in mind as we work through this. Number one, each of us answers to God, not to each other. Okay? In fact, it says this in Romans, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls and he'll be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. It's not my job to judge your job. Well, you know, you work at a place that doesn't pay you enough. You work, you're just chasing money. You're just chasing your career. That's not my place. That is your place. Be aware you're going to answer to God for your career and the decisions that you've made. It's not your job to judge the person next to you, okay? It's your job to ask God, am I doing the work that you have called me to do? Secondly, perspective is key. Do you remember when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, there was a man with a withered hand? And the Pharisees' perspective was what? If Jesus heals on Sabbath, he worked on Sabbath, he is bad, he can't heal. Jesus' perspective was what? I'll ask you this, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? Jesus came to do what? To save life. So what did he tell the man with the withered hand to do? Stretch out your hand. To the Pharisees, that was work, that was horrible, that was evil, that broke all the laws, this was a bad. To Jesus, he was bringing life. Can I give you a, a contemporary perspective? I'm just going to make this one up, okay, just to kind of work with us. Let's talk about Starbucks, okay? When Starbucks began, it offered coffee. Should we talk about Starbucks? Yeah, 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 absolutely. We're going to talk about Starbucks. When, Jesus, when Starbucks began, it was to offer a third place. Are you familiar with the third place? Home is your first place. Work is your second place. I don't want you in my house because it's too messy. That's my private place. I definitely don't want to meet you at work. I'm going to meet you at Starbucks. It's a third place. It's a safe place. We drink our coffee, the Starbucks experience. You know, anytime you pay more for coffee, it tastes better. You feel more status. And so it's this great idea. Obviously, over time, I think that Starbucks has kind of gone for money. Again, I'm not trying to demonize it. I'm just trying to walk you through this stuff. And so then they began to do drive throughs You remember that was the big thing. You, you no longer have the Starbucks experience with the drive through but ka-ching, ka-ching, we can run more customers through. Then they began to raise prices. Now nobody goes to Starbucks for the third space. Everybody goes to get their morning fix because they've addicted all of us to getting our $7. It's now like 7 or $8 for a latte, which is ridiculous. But we pay it anyway because we feel cool. And now we're just drinking sugar and fat and all this other crud into our bodies. And Starbucks is also a huge LGBTQ supporter. So you can actually make a case that working at Starbucks is like probably the worst thing ever a Christian could do. Okay. When you take, you know, what they stand for, uh, just, you know, all the the junk that they feed us and how fast they run us through the drive-thru and all that other stuff, no Christian should ever work at Starbucks. Or you can take the other side. You could be a barista at Starbucks And you could smile at each person that comes in. Yes, you can't say God bless you and no, you're not going to have a Bible study, but you can acknowledge that it started as a third place and your goal is to make it a third place and you make drinks to the best of your abilities. Maybe you're a college student and Starbucks provides really flexible hours. They also provide benefits, I believe, for their, um, for all their employees. I think they also were some of the first ones to pioneer $15 an hour. So it's one of the better jobs you can get as a college student. Um, so you're not only going to get a scholarship, you're going to get all of that and flexibility and you're going to be able to be a light in that darkness. Do you think Starbucks is now the best place to work? It can be. It's not my job to tell you to work at Starbucks or not work at Starbucks. It's your job to ask, can I spread shalom? 
And if you can spread shalom there and God opens those doors and that's where you're called and that's your gifting and that's what provides your needs, then you need to do that to the best of your abilities. If you begin to feel that you're not able to spread shalom there and you're not able to meet your needs and so forth, then you're going to do something else. But you need to take that perspective and ask Jesus, where can I spread the most shalom? Jesus didn't ask, what's the technical interpretation and all that crud that the Pharisees had? He said, how can I do the most good? How can I save a life? How can I spread shalom? in the world, and that needs to be the question at your workplace, not how can I cut the bottom line, how can I save money, how can I push this forward? Are you following me? All right. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians. I want to close with this passage because I think this is the important thing. Some of you are saying, Robert, okay, so do I need a new job? Do I not? I'm going to give you four examples that Paul gives us in Corinthians. It is dealing predominantly with marriage, but there's this other idea that Daniel Doriani pulls out in one of the workbooks that I was re- books on work that I was reading that I just thought was brilliant. Paul is going to give us four examples here that all build on stay unless because. It's a brilliant application for your life, and I just want to share it with you this morning beginning in verse 8, okay? He's going to talk to single people, to the unmarried and the widows. I say this, it is good for them to remain single as I am. So the ideal state is to remain single because single people can serve God anywhere. If you are single, whether you are widowed, whether you're divorced, whether you're never married, God can call you to do anything and you can do it. I can't. I have a moral obligation to my wife and my children. That's why I generally don't meet people on Fridays and Saturdays. I do everything I can to put it during the week because that's time reserved for my family to care for them. That is part of the obligation that God has given me. If you are single, you don't have that obligation. You can do anything for God. And so Paul says, ideally, stay single. Most churches are going to teach you to be married. Paul says, stay single. Unless, look at verse 9, if they cannot exercise self-control, you should stay single unless you're going to engage in sexual activity. Okay, And if you cannot exercise self-control, if you're going to engage in sexual immorality, if you're going to be involved in pornography, if you're going to be moving in with your you know, significant other, if you're going to be sleeping around, in that case, you should marry. Because, here's our because, it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Yes, ideally as a single person, you can serve God anywhere, but if you are so controlled with your sexual thoughts that that takes up all of your energy to stay pure, then you're not really useful for God. You should get married, and then you can be useful for God as a married person. Are you following me? Generally, stay in the job that God's called you to, unless it's going to drive you into sin, in which case you need to do something else. Obviously, if you're a drug dealer, you need a new career. Okay? If you're in the sex industry, you need a new career. By the way, in America, it's getting increasingly difficult because we are increasingly dominated by money. My daughters work at an ice cream shop, and a couple years earlier in the summer, they were upselling for a cancer cause. And my daughter loved it because she could do a cute smile, and whoever sold the most, you know, upsells a dollar for the, for the cancer cause got a bonus, and she got the bonus. Well, now they want them to upsell just for the owner's pocket. And so they're encouraging everybody, you know, you want to large with that, right? And can I add this? And can I add that? And she's like, why am I doing that? Again, not necessarily wrong. It's good to make money. The, the owner needs to provide for the company and so on and so forth. But you see the difference? And many of you are being pushed encouragingly more just to make additional money that's not necessarily there to benefit anyone other than just our corporate greed. And so you need to ask, and if that's the case, it may be time to look for something different, okay? Let's look at our unsafe spouse's potential, okay? Uh, verse 11. To the rest, uh, verse 12. To the rest I say, not, I, I, not the Lord, if a brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Some of you and many in our church are this way. You're a believer, but your spouse is not a believer. And you struggle with that because you really want a Christian home. You want a God-honoring home, and yet you come to church every week, and you're the only Christian, and your spouse is not supporting you. And some of you are like, okay, should I stay married to a non-believer? And notice what Paul says. If, he can, if she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Um, verse 13, if any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Why? Because the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. There is this, I don't know how to describe it, but the Christians, we as Christians do have some kind of a 
spiritual halo effect. There is something, if you are a believer in your home, you bring a certain, you don't necessarily save everybody in the home, but there is some kind of holiness that you impart to your home. In your workplace, you may work in a totally pagan office, but if you are a believer there, you are bringing a certain level of spirituality into that place. You are being a light in that darkness. And if they consent to live with you, you should stay. But, verse 15, unless... If the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to, and here's our word, he's called us to peace. The goal is not to beat your unbelieving spouse over the head. You better be saved. I can't believe you're a pagan. You're going to go to hell. The goal is not to beat your you know, unbelieving boss over the head. I can't believe you're a Muslim. I can't believe you don't support Christianity. That's not going to do anything. Seek peace. And if they'll let you stay, stay. But if you get fired for being a Christian, if your spouse who is an unbeliever divorces you because you're a believer, let them go. God has called you to peace. But in the meantime, stay, verse 16, because how do you know, wife, whether will you'll save your husband? And how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And how do you know, worker, whether you, being in that unsaved office, will bring the gospel at some point? If we all had to go out and join Christian compounds when we got saved, what would happen to the rest of the world? It'd fall apart, would it not? So for the most part, if you can, stay, all right? The key in verse 17, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. This is a funny one. Verse 18, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. That's a little hard to do. All right. And so Paul says, you don't need to go back. What's the point? Back in the day, everybody had to become a Jew. If you were going to become a Christian, you had to become a Jew. Now God is taking the gospel all over the world. You don't have to become a Jew. Many of us think American Christian. A lot of missionaries used to go out and they began to make kind of uh, Americanized Christian churches. You don't have to be an American to be a Christian. A lot of us feel like there's nothing here and the only good people are to be missionaries. And we feel like God's only working around the globe. The point is God's not working over there. God's not working only here. God is working everywhere. And when you come to faith, you don't have to switch cultures. You don't have to become an American Christian, or you don't have to become a Bohemian Christian or a Peruvian Christian. You can be a Christian in the culture to which God has called you. You don't have to change. Because in verse 19, neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision. Being a Jew, being a Gentile, that doesn't matter. What matters is keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Finally, and this is the one that really ties into work, were you a bondservant, verse 21, when you were called? Don't be concerned about it. We don't have bondservants in our society, but I think the closest thing would be minimum wage jobs. You can kind of get trapped in a minimum wage job, and if you don't have uh, either education or connections, it's very hard to break out of that. And if you're stuck in a minimum wage job, what does Paul say? Don't worry about it. Because notice this. He says this, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. If you can move up, if you can get a promotion, you probably should. And I would say as a general rule, if God gives you an opportunity to advance your career, to generally to make more money, to have greater influence, that's even more important than making money. If you are able to gain more influence, I would encourage you to do this. I think every one of you should be looking to go up the ladder. But if you get shut down, And because you're a Christian, you don't get promoted, or maybe you're not the right race and you don't get promoted, you're not the right gender, you don't get promoted, or you don't buy into all of the DEI or whatever it is that they're pushing down, and you get stalled out, that's okay, because God has you where he wants you to be. Because notice verse 22, he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man in the Lord. If you feel you are the bottom rung of the the economic ladder, you are the bottom of the business barrel, right? And you can't ever get promoted and you're just stuck down there. You are a child of the most high God. Don't you dare tell me I'm just a bus boy. I am just a minimum wage worker. I am just this. You are a child of the most high God. If you can work your way higher, that's great. If you can't, don't worry about it. You are a child of God. Likewise... He who is free when called. Are you an executive? Do you own your own company? You make six figures, oversee 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, have tremendous influence. What does God call you? A slave. You don't have what you think you have. You are a slave to God. 
Those who are high need to realize we are nothing but God's slaves. Those who are low need to remember we are children of the Most High God. You realize it's both for both, but you understand what I'm saying, how God keeps us humble. This is what he says here. That's why, verse 22, 23, you were bought with a price. Don't become bondservants of men. Don't let your career run your life. You are owned by God now. You may actually need to pursue a job that takes less of your time so that you're able to devote more to God's kingdom. You need to pray through that. You need to seek God's face in that regard. But as a general principle, verse 24, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Most likely, unless your job is really pushing you to sin and really has absolutely zero redeeming value in the world, most of you will remain in your job. And that's what God has called you to do. And you need to do it well. You need to do it for his glory. So I ask you this, think about your work, whether it's paid or unpaid, the work that God gives you, where is shalom lacking? How can you bring shalom to what has God called you? What's your calling? What gifts do you have? And how much do you actually need to be paid? Okay, can you make a shift in that? And how can you spread shalom in your work? Because that's your entire goal. And if you need to change, do you have a new calling? Is God putting a new season of life in your, in your life? Could you better utilize your gifts? And could you bring more shalom through different work? Because we want to bring shalom to this world. Can I pray? Heavenly Father, I just pray as we leave from this place that we would go and we would bring shalom that we would bring the goodness and the greatness and the glory of God everywhere we go, that we would leave the world a, a more peaceful place, a more complete place, a whole place, a place where there is prosperity, where there is health, where there is friendship, where there is community. And God, I pray that you would use the people of friendship to bring that about. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.